Christmas Virginia Mail, starring in Neil Patterson's exciting story, China Run. <laughs> of the sea is a wonderful thing. Maybe there's a sauna sweeter than the wind in an arching sail, but I don't know it. There may be a symphony grander than wild waves laughing, but I've never heard it. There is no lovelier sound than a bellboy in the bay when the sailor comes home from the sea. This is what I've heard, and I think it's so. But I know this, too. The blue rolling sea is a fickle sea. She's ready one time to grant your most cherished dreams and waiting the next with death hiding just below the running wave. Come in. Good evening, Father. Good evening, Father. Oh, come in, come in. You too, Jane. Although I didn't expect you. I wanted to see my son. And I'm only a daughter. But it's nice to know I'm accepted, even if I am a woman. <laughs> woman. A mere child, and yet she calls us that. That's enough, Jane. I want to talk to you. I know, Father. You know. It's always been the same ever since I was 20. You come home for a month, I do believe, only to talk me into shipping out to sea with you. Uh, but, Jane... And the I... night before you sail, you try again. Just like tonight. Then it's no use. No, Father. I don't know why you persist. Uh, because I'm a seaman, I guess. A master of a ship, a good ship. I want my son to succeed. You're so sentimental, Father. But someone must stay ashore to tend the ship's business. You prefer a Dublin counting house to a sailing ship. A sailing ship is like a jail, with a chance of getting drowned. And a sailor. Well, a sailor's a beast of burden. Then there's nothing I can say. Good night, Father. I'll see you tomorrow before you sail. Father. Yes, Jane. Father. I, I want to go with you. Yes, yes, you. What? I want to go to sea. Oh, but you can't, Jane. You're a girl. It's 1845, Father. The world no longer belongs exclusively to its male. Oh, but the hazards are too great aboard a cargo ship. I have no facilities for passengers. I have no intention of being a passenger. But I mean to be a sailor. Jane, you're a girl. I'm as good as any man and better than some. Uh, your brother now, I can't make him go to sea. And you can't make me stay ashore. But the storms, the discomfort. I want to go to sea. Sickness and death. I've got to go to sea. And the China Coast pirate. I must, Father, I must. But, but I'll be the laughing stock if Tansy McCoy finds out. And who is Tansy McCoy? A miserable Yankee, the vilest skipper on the China run. Sounds like a competitor. Mm, he's the rankest man that ever offended my nostrils. Then why worry about it? All right. All right, but... No more buts, Father. But... What will my crew say? <laughs> The crew said plenty. The crew of a windjammer is always wet and always numb from lack of sleep. For the wind and the weather wait for no man, and the sails are constantly changed. The work on a windjammer is endless, but the men find time to talk and talk and talk. An evil omen it is, a woman aboard. Uh, it wouldn't happen on a Yankee ship. Fancy a Yank like Tansy McCoy suffering a lady aboard. Uh, uh, more like a witch she is. Standing on the lee side of the poop. Aye, bosun. But a handsome witch. Aye. And always with a question. Oh, she'd better ask questions. She doesn't know a head from a halyard. Ah, no. She will. She will. Her tongue's sharp and is shaped like a question mark. Uh, she should be ashore and married. Well, the kind of man she needs can't be found ashore. Uh, she needs a man like Chancy McCoy now. <laughs> <laughs> He'd answer her questions. <laughs> Bosun. I'm 
I've been watching the wind in the lower main top gallon sail and the upper main top sail. <laughs> That's the stunsels, ma'am. The main to gallant and the metopsil. They form the stunsels. Uh, uh, yes. Well, anyway, they're always shredded at the lip. Now, why couldn't they be reinforced? Reinforced, ma'am? With what? Have you tried wax? You wax the yarn, it might not cut the sail. Ah, but who has the wax? We have tallow dipped in the lamp. You might try that. Hmm, tallow. Yes, ma'am, I think I might. Yes, the crew had plenty to say. And so had the ship's officers. Mistress West is uncommon handy about the ship. Ah, Mr. Jordan. Even in weather. Aye, Mr. Hammond. Even in petticoats. <laughs> <laughs> the rate of Fancy McCoy get to look at them. Ah, yes. Don't you worry about McCoy. You just worry about your birth as second mate. I believe she's after it. Uh, begging your pardon, sir. He's after bigger game. Your birth as first mate. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there's a bit of nonsense. Why, it takes years to master navigation alone. Even I still have much to learn about navigation. Uh, I, uh, I passed her cabin this morning, and I uh, happened to glance through the porthole. Ah? Uh, she was reading. <laughs> A novel, I suppose. Some fluffy romantic novel. She was reading the memoirs of, of a French actress, an Irish admiral, called Advanced Principles of Navigation. Evening, Captain. Mistress West. Good evening. Gentlemen, please be seated. Thank you, sir. Ah, and what do we have for supper tonight? Same as we had for dinner. Cold harness beef and black bread. This is preposterous. Why, George Simpson's the best cook ever to sail with me. He was, sir. You talk like he's dead. Well, he will be soon. Come down with the smallpox this morning. He's in considerable pain, sir. Blisters have already appeared on the soles of his feet. Well, get a razor and cut them off. That's the usual procedure, is it not? Well, it is for anyone but George Simpson. He won't let us near him. And he's a giant of a man, sir. I'm aware of his stature, Mr. Jordan. But he's in the corner of the forecastle with a belaying pin in one hand and his own razor in the other. He's promised to use him on the first man who comes near. Now, a man that obstinate deserves to die. Father. My dear. May I be excused? Of course. Oh, uh, my apologies, Mistress West. My talk of smallpox and blisters and razors is perhaps too strong. Well, if she wants a sailor's life, she must get used to sailor's talk. Run along, Jane, if you must. She is little more than a child. Bolt of canvas. I'm going to measure you for a shroud. Oh, no. oh. There. Now all we need is a sinker. Oh, Mistress West, I don't want to die. Oh, but you're going to, Simpson. <laughs> then we'll drop you over the side and the fishes will eat you. Oh, no, 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 Mistress. You cut off the soles of my feet. You do it. Give me your razor, Simpson. Uh. Thank you. Just let me holler, mistress, because I don't hold much with pain. It'll be pain. Now, if you just let me have your belaying pin. I... That's right. <laughs> Simpson, I'm going to tap you on the head with it, lightly. Just hard enough to keep you from feeling the pain. Oh. Now, whenever you're ready. Uh, go ahead, mistress. All right, Simpson. <laughs> Let me tell you, that day was long remembered. And the men gathered round the scuttle but talked as if with wonder. 
Ah, she's Yar, that girl. <laughs> and the demon with the belaying pin. Is that right, Simpson? A flying fish sailor she is, and I'm that proud of the lump on my head. It's like a bloody decoration. Uh, it is that, but she done the decorating. <laughs> oh, guts she's got. And salt water in her veins. And so they talk. All of them. That is safe, Sam, and, and he was soon to learn. What's the reading, Mr. Hammond? Right on, sir. It will make warn you by morning. Yes, sir. But if I may say so, sir, you fix the longitude correct to a hair's breadth. Mm. And in the gale with one star poking out of a cloud bank for not more than three seconds, you have, sir, a genius for precise navigation. I'm sorry to disabuse you, Mr. Hammond. The calculations were made by my daughter. Good evening, sir, and enjoy your shore leave in morning. Let me tell you, there's nothing so wondrous strange as your first leave in a foreign port. And there's no port so strange as Borneo, where 30 foot snakes and, and 6 foot anteaters and deer are no bigger than jackrabbits wander into town to look at the people. And the people themselves have certain quirks, like bathing every day. Where to now, Mistress West? Really, Mr. Jordan, I can manage without your protection. Your father's orders, ma'am. Nonsense. I have my belay in here. Sorry, Mistress West. And the sounds of Borneo are strange. The tiny deer I mentioned before have a habit of barking like dogs. And a Burmese man plays a bamboo flute. That is no interest whatsoever, except that he plays it with his nose. The strangest sound of all came from an outdoor saloon. Five hundred brave Americans. Who's that? That's Captain Tansy McCoy. Who is this Captain Tansy McCoy? I don't rightly know, ma'am. Some say he's wild and dissolute, a little better than a pirate. Some say he's the finest Yankee skipper that ever drove a ship. And what do you say, Mr. Jordan? All I know is he carries a cannon mounted on the forepeak. He sees us. He's coming this way. Ah. And who, sir, are you staring at? The lady, sir. The lady. <laughs> Uh, trim ship she is. She looks to be running free. That's enough, sir. One more insult and I'll be forced. You're forcing me first. <laughs> and now, my pretty lass. Take another step. <laughs> I love a lass with juice and ground. I'm warning you. Worn away. You wouldn't hit me with that belaying pin. No. Of course I wouldn't. <laughs> and that's what happened, Father. What about Mr. George? I left him with some missionaries. His jaw was broken. And McCoy? I left him on the ground. I think I might have killed him. Uh, good riddance. What'll I do for a second mate? Father, I'd like Mr. Jordan's birth as second officer. Uh, I don't know. You do know. I wonder. You know I can handle it. Of course you can. But I wonder if you didn't plan it all just to get Jordan's birth. <laughs> Let me tell you, there is no prouder lot than those who follow the sea. And the proudest time of all is the time of your first command. Especially with the challenge of a race. Helmsman, half point, starboard. Aye, aye, sir. I mean, ma'am, I beg your pardon. 
Oh, that's all right, Elmsman. You get used to it. This was West. That ship up the foreign quarter is still coming up fast. Let the hounds drop off another point. Aye, aye, sir. What's the commotion, Jane? A ship, Father. Take a look through the telescope. Uh, a Yankee clipper. Oh, with a cannon on the forepeak. That can't be McCall, McCall's ship. Well, if it's a race they want, we'll give it to them. Bolton, loose with the gallon. Aye, aye, sir. Loose with the gallon. The Yanks still gaining, Father. Bolton, can't you set more sail into the royal? Captain, we've put everything we got, except in the second mate's petticoat. No use, Father. He's hard upon us and coming alongside. He's after trouble. He's going to find it. Ahoy! Ahoy! Up and west! It's McCoy, Father. I didn't kill him after all. Pick up, you Yankees. Come. Up and west! I want to marry your daughter. Never, not for a thousand pounds. Too much, Captain West. But I'll give you a hundred. Hard do, ship. Careful, Captain. Don't the lady aboard. Be in the Philippines. <laughs> In just a moment, we will continue with Act Two of the Hollywood Radio Theater. Make a friend, and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. In 1864, Clara Barton gave up a successful job in the patent office in Washington and devoted the rest of her life to bringing physical and mental aid to the wounded and dying on the battlefield. At first, it was the soldiers of the American Civil War. But when the war ended, she was forced to go abroad to recuperate from nervous exhaustion. While she was in Switzerland, Napoleon declared war on Prussia. Clara Barton was urged to return to her own country, but she refused. She felt it was her duty to remain in Europe and help the wounded of this new war. It didn't make any difference to her if they were French or Prussian. She didn't ask the nationality of the sufferer when she stopped the flow of blood from a soldier's wound. In spite of many inconveniences and hardships, she traveled across the rugged German countryside to reach the Prussian front lines. But there she was told that the only way she could be allowed into a front line camp would be as a prisoner of war. Clara Barton agreed, and as a prisoner until the end of the war, she continued to do her work with the wounded Prussian soldiers. After the war, she remained in Europe to help the defeated French. When she sailed for home in 1873, grateful Europeans bestowed on her many medals of honor, including the Gold Cross of Remembrance, the Jewel of the Red Cross, and the Iron Cross of Merit. Once again, an unselfish American had discovered that by helping others, you help your country. And now, Act Two of China Run, starring Virginia Mayo as Jane. <laughs> tell you about the Philippines. More than 7,000 islands sprawling like blue pepper into the China Sea. Sort of an interesting place where a lot of people prefer roast dog or a fried locust to any delicacy you could name. A place where nobody looks at an orchid, possibly because more than 900 varieties grow wild. In Manila, they make the world's best spittoon and go to a university called Santa Tomas, which was founded in 1585, half a century before Harvard. Yes, Manila's an interesting sort of place, full of surprises. First came not an hour after we birthed. Uh, top of the morning, Mrs. West, ma'am. The glorious day to you both. It may continue to be so, but I've got my doubts. There's a visitor on the Pope wishing a word with your father. My father's ashore, as you very well know. Aye, and the visitor, therefore, is wishing a word with you. Very well, I'll see him. It's only one thing, ma'am. It's Captain Chancy McCoy. 
It's the audacity, dear man, to set foot on this deck. Inform Captain McCoy that I have nothing to discuss with him, either now or any future occasion. And kindly to serve me by taking his dissolute and worthless self off my ship. Well, here he comes now, ma'am. Uh, maybe you'd better tell him. Bolton, set that water bucket by me. Aye, aye, ma'am. Thank you. You may go now. Ah, there you are. Captain McCoy, will you I please... I come to the point, Mistress West. I come to call on Captain West to present my credentials. For what purpose? With the hand of his daughter in marriage. If my father were here, I'm sure he wouldn't give it to you. Well, then it's better that he is absent. Uh, quite frankly, Mrs. West, I don't hold with your stodgy Irish custom of asking a father's permission. And quite frankly, Captain McCoy, I don't hold with your savage American practice of asking no one's permission. Of kidnapping young ladies in a Western Indian <laughs> fashion. You've been grossly misinformed, but uh, why should I ask your father? I don't want to marry him. And I would never marry you or anyone without my father's consent. That gives me little choice except to kidnap you in the Western Indian fashion. Take one more step in this water bucket will cool your ardor. Takes more than water to... Look, look at our matey, she washed him right off the ship. <laughs> and into the sea, cleansing him of his sin. Of which there are no doubt plenty. <laughs> that night, the dockside pubs were full of the affair. And the ship's chandlers who came on board shook the heads gravely. And the next morning, a meeting was convened, and the folks... <coughs> now, uh, now, every one of you knows why we're here. Uh, well, Chauncey McCoy is a dangerous man to be made fool of. We must protect our mistress West. Aye, aye, aye. From herself, before she kills him. <laughs> so, but I, I'm against it. Chain stays an anchor, I'm against it. Now, why can't she stay aboard ship? Why must she go ashore? Well, no, she's got her rights. And if she don't, well, it looks unseemly for all of us. I mean, well, what I mean is, uh, it's like we're afraid. Aye. McCoy and his yanks don't frighten me. I'll be her bodyguard. And I. Well, I, I'm still against it. Yeah, but deal me in. <laughs> was an extraordinary procession. The bosun, armed with a revolver. The giant Simpson with a belt full of knives which clanked together as he walked. And the helmsman, full of swagger and swashbuckling fear. And the young girl, imperious as any queen, who rather enjoyed it all. Hey, uh, begging your pardon, ma'am, but uh, how long are you aiming to tear at it? I'm sorry. Suppose my shopping holds little interest for you. Uh, well, the, the truth is, ma'am, it is a wondrous batik. Uh, but I'm uh, more interested in a good stiff drop of the wet. Of course. Oh, perhaps I can come back. Oh, no need, Missy. The batik is yours. Mine? Oh, yes, Missy. A gift from a uh, gentleman over there. Where? I it's McCoy, ma'am. Oh, I'm glad you like the batik, ma'am. I, I... I cannot accept it. But I insist. And I insist no yank will give the Mistress West gift. I already have. And I've got something for you, too. And now, Mistress no. West. Stay away from me. Your zoo wants payment, ma'am. And so do you. You <laughs> change. All of you look like you've been through the eye of a hurricane. Why don't you? What happened? 
We... We met Captain McCoy. But Jane, where's your skirt? Father, I have just experienced as, as public a humiliation as has ever befallen one of my sex. Ah, now, miss, it, uh, it wasn't as bad as all that. And we got in a few good licks of our own, sir. I knifed him in the shoulder and then... Well, then he must have hit me from behind. And, and I hit him with a spittoon. <laughs> you should have seen the spittoon. Sir... I shot him in the arm, and then... Well, then, I purely don't know what happened. Then allow me to tell you. You, Mr. Simpson, were sprawled unconscious in the street. But, ma'am, I... I... Helmsman, you were stretched out on a bench as neat as at your own funeral. <coughs> and you, Bozen, were tossed over a table and were propped stiff-backed and glassy-eyed against the wall. Oh, no, miss. And then... Then he came after me. Jane, he, he didn't... He swept me off my feet and onto a counter. He pinned me down with his wounded arm, the blood dripping onto my finery. He seized my skirt, ripping it away, threw the silk around his arm and knotted it with his teeth. And then, then I fled back to the ship in only my three petticoats, closely followed by my... My bodyguard. Uh, now, look, Mistress... Get for all, you three. Uh, I, 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 Now, Jane, you know, Americans are a strange race, particularly at love or war. They seem to confuse the two. Perhaps you'd better marry him. Marry him? Never. Do you love him, Jane? I could only love a man who honors, not disgraces me. Who rescues me from violence, not drags me into it. Who shields me from the ills in the front of the world, not showers me with them. Who sustains, not humiliates me in an hour my, of need. My, 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 how you run on. You're a child, Jane, confusing a husband with a knight in the novel on a white charger. All I want is for him to let me alone. He'll never do that. Oh, yes, he will. He doesn't want me. I'm just an excuse for him to start a brawl. Father, if you'll only belay my impossibly useless bodyguard. That I won't do. I'll increase it. Please, Father, just in Siam. There'll be no trouble in Siam, Jane. What makes you so sure? Because I intend to play the stern father. You won't be seeing the sights and problems in the marketplaces. You don't expect me to stay aboard ship. Oh, nothing so drastic as that. But each day you'll go to a home of a friend of mine. An artist. I want him to paint your portrait. All right, Father. I will on one condition. Which is? No bodyguard. Well, I suppose it's just as well. Otherwise, I won't have an able-bodied seaman left in the crew. <laughs> Bangkok in Siam is a town of nitric salesmen, an illustrious artist, who aren't quite as peculiar as a certain species of Siamese perch, which climb trees. In Siam, the umbrella, and not the crown, is a symbol of royalty. And it's impossible for a foreigner to learn the language. Not that it's so difficult. You see, the people are so polite, no one presumes to correct your mistake. There were six gloriously peaceful days in Bangkok. Six quiet days of sitting like a waterlogged sponge for a portrait. Not a sign of Captain Tansy McCoy. Then, on the seventh day... Come in, Mistress Owen. Uh, is my portrait ready? Indeed, Mistress Owen. And I have a visitor. That is, you have a visitor. I? I know no one in Bangkok. How quickly you forget an old friend. Captain McCoy. None other, ma'am. I'm uh, much taken by your picture here. Mm. Turn around. I'll do no such thing. Oh, ma'am, you should always blush. It's so becoming. Now turn around. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, 
Yes, sir. You're something pretty special for the China Sea. You know, you knocked the spots off in any of the last batch of dancing girls the Frenchman brought in. How dare you? Why is it, Mistress West, you can't accept my compliments any more than you'll accept my gifts? What right have you to give them? What right have you to refuse them? You rate yourself too high. You rate me too easy. Just remember this. There are growlers enough in this sea. Now I'll waste no more of my time. But first we'll see if temper will thaw you. Min Sing. Miss West! Miss West! Now, no. I will not tell you. Ah. Captain mm. McCoy, if you will glance down the street, yeah. you will find we are being watched. Watched by not less than 20 seamen from my ship. Perhaps you'd like to fight them all. I think I'll have the opportunity. They're coming this way. Do you require anything, ma'am? Oh, uh, well, uh, no, thank you, Bosun. Well, ma'am, you want any help? Uh, no, of course not. Captain McCoy here is seeing me back to the ship. Are you ready, Captain? <laughs> At your service, Mistress West. <laughs> Here, Captain McCoy. I'll go fetch my father. And Mrs. West, you, uh, you think I'll have trouble with him? Uh, not have the trouble you had with me. Yeah, that was enough. Uh, he's always been dead set against me. Don't worry. I'll be back. Father. Uh, oh, some other time, Jay. Listen to me, Father. I've brought a guest. Captain McCoy. Oh, splendid. It's bound to happen. Now if you let me get on with my work. What's the matter, Father? Uh, a naughty little problem in nitrate. Can I help, Father? I doubt it, Jane. But perhaps Fancy McCoy can. Now might be your chance to find out if McCoy is that knight in shining armor you were searching for. What do you mean? Where is Captain McCoy? Show him to the wardroom, by all means. And in Guam, I saw men ride cattle instead of horses. Possibly because they don't have horses to ride. And the women. The women cut their hair. Terrible, isn't it? And I've heard that in Japan people fly kites like children and eat grilled ape and pickled seaweed. That's true, true. But you know, the weirdest place I've ever been is an island, oh, half a world away. Oh? Mm hmm well, there, there are 3,000 sacred wishing wells, and according to the natives, the we folk flourish, and um, it's customary to keep them from curdling fresh milk by putting a coffin nail near the crock. How curious. What's the name of this place? Ireland. Oh. Have you heard of it, Captain West? What? Well, what? I beg your pardon, sir. Uh, it's quite all right, sir. I... Dear, I've overstayed my welcome. Oh, not at all. It's just... What is it, Father? Captain McCoy, I may speak bluntly before you. I, I, I'm in some difficulty. That's all? I've discovered that my nitrate cargo is underweight. But the hole is filled. I saw it. It's green, Jane. Green as a sapling. Liable to 10% shrinkage in the passage to China. Well, make the company remove the stuff and reload. Yeah, the manager refused to do so. Why are you telling me this, Captain West? Well, I I thought perhaps you might join with me in protest. You've shown certain attributes of leadership among the other shipmasters in this harbor. And together, all of us could fall. overlook one consideration, Captain West. The nitrate in my hold is not green. 
Then you won't help. What made you think I would? Well, with things what they are between Jane and... Sir, are you offering me your daughter's hand for a mess of stinking night grape? Captain McCoy, my father meant no such thing. Will you please leave our ship? Gladly. And, Mistress West, why don't you put a coffin nail in the nitrate? Perhaps it would keep it from curdling. I'm sorry, Jane. I shouldn't have ever mentioned it. It's all right, Father. But I've ended your romance. Never began, Father. He isn't the only growl in the sea. And he certainly isn't the only shipmaster in Bangkok. What do you mean by that? We'll call a meeting of ship's masters. Perhaps our hold isn't the only one loaded with green nitrate. Perhaps if we all get together, something will be done. Even without the exalted presence of Kenzie McCoy. <laughs> Act three of the Hollywood Radio Theater will continue in just a few moments. Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind as many another American has. When Mark Twain first traveled abroad, he hit upon an idea which was to bring a note of seriousness to his writing. He decided to tour Europe and write a series of articles which might erase the existing prejudices that Americans had for foreigners and vice versa. He wrote about the questionable behavior of some American tourists abroad and about the European stubborn refusal to recognize the fact that such Americans were not an honest picture of their countrymen. Well, gradually, people all over the world became interested enough in his writings to buy his books. Through them, they learned to understand and respect each other. After his marriage, he and his wife visited Australia, New Zealand, Ceylon, and India, and his writings continued to strengthen the bond of international friendship. Here, in his own words, is an example of his understanding of people. I came to England, he once wrote, with the intention of writing a devastating satire on your form of life. I anticipated finding great humor in your English culture and your social customs. Instead, I found English home life to be a substantial and altogether admirable institution. Your society furnishes examples to be followed rather than satirized. You've given me a fuller understanding of your country and your people. He also gave America a fuller understanding of England, for he discovered that by helping others, you help your country. We pause now for station identification. Curtain rises on Act Three of China Run, starring Virginia Mayo as Jane. Gentlemen. The count shows that a little more than <coughs> half the ships in this harbor have been loaded with bad order nitrate. A show of hands has indicated that all of us, regardless of whether we've been, pers been personally victimized or not, mean to stand together. A delegation comprising Captains West, Woodward, Clausen, and Werner will present a bill of particulars to the company in the morning. <laughs> One more point, gentlemen, before we adjourn. Of all the ships in port, only Captain Tansy McCoy's is not represented here tonight. Uh, Father, what did the company say? Oh, they deplored the incredible error of loading green nitrate. And what did they mean to do about it? Just about anything and everything. Wonderful. They've offered us a special cargo, selected with the management in person and at a reduced rate. It will be loaded at our convenience. And when is our convenience? Now. Jane. 
I, I just want to say, Jane, I'm that proud of you. Thank you, Father. If only... Father, don't start that again. You so much as mention me in the same breath with Tansy McCoy. I'll... All, all, all right, Jane. At this time, I'll, I'll supervise the loading myself. Mistress West? Yes, Mr. Hammond. The last of the new cargo has been stored, Mistress West. And uh, I checked the manifest myself. Very good, sir. Have you hired a third officer? I did. An Englishman. He'd been on the beach two years and happy to catch a bird home. You've been a great help, Mr. Hammond. Thank you, I have. I'd, uh, I'd like to do more, Mistress West. Much more. Mr. Hammond, since my father's death, there's no longer a reason for your calling me Mistress West. Ah. I've been wanting to, to call you Jane for a long while. You're jumping to conclusions. Please address me as Captain West. Captain? I'm taking command of the ship. Well, but, well, I have master's papers and seniority, and I, I, I'm the first officer. And you shall continue to be so long as you carry out your duties. Now set the watch, Mr. Hammond. We're sailing for Pooh Chow. Aye, aye, Captain West. Now Pooh Chow is a river port, rich and stinking. The stench comes from the river Min, from the collected garbage of the centuries, consigned to a wet grave by the populace and the river pirates. Its wealth comes from the illustrious tea of the hinterland. All day long, the buffalo trains converge on the city, bearing tea and lacquered checks. And all day long, among the reefs and the shallows, the pirates wait for a likely ship. What is it? Yeah, Mr. Harmon's compliments, ma'am. He'd like you on deck at once. Very well. What now, Mr. Hammond? That ship off stern. It's Tansy McCoy's. History repeating itself. But this time, Mr. Hammond, the result will be different. I mean to clue up in Fuchow before him. Captain West, this ship cannot outsail a Baltimore clipper. We won't outsail him, Mr. Hammond. We'll outsmart him. We'll bear toward shore as we round the cape. Half the distance. Yes, but the pirates. They'll take the cargo and they'll hold you for ransom. Are you afraid, Mr. Hammond? Now listen to me. I served once with a captain whose wife they took. And they finally returned her, finger by finger. I'll worry about my fingers if you'll proceed with my command. Aye, aye, Captain West. We're holding our lead. That small consolation, Captain West. Look forward off the bow. Those junks? Twenty-four of them. 
Each man by 20 men. They're pirates, Captain West. And they're heading for us. Swing back to mid-channel. No, we can't get by them. A couple more minutes, they'll be aboard. They'll never take us. They're closing in now. We'll ram them. That won't help. Nothing will help. It's McCoy! <laughs> ah, Captain West. McCoy is moving up alongside. Mr. Hammond, the megaphone, please. Captain West, are you all right, ma'am? Captain McCoy, I am indebted to you. Save your breath, Captain West. My thanks to you, sir. Save your thanks for Fu Chow. Will you meet me at the King Henry? Will you, Captain West? Maybe, Captain McCoy. And I'll be waiting, Captain West. How is the cargo moving, Mr. Hammond? Well, now, Captain, the tea is in the hold, and everything is squared away. Then I'll take a look at Fu Chow. I, uh, might not be back for supper. Yes, ma'am. Oh, oh, Mr. Hammond. Perhaps you could direct me to the King Henry. Well, you go right up the... Well... Mr. Swift... Yes? Please accept my condolences to your father, Mr. Swift. I'm at your service if there's anything Who I Who are can... you, sir? Berend's the name. George Berend, local agent for the ship. And now, if you'll permit me, I have business with your captain. Who is your captain, Mr. Swift? I am. I see. I beg your pardon. I said I'm master of the ship. But a girl like you... You obviously don't have the master's papers. No. But then the insurance will be revoked, and the cargo will be jeopardized. And the ship must be handed over to the first officer immediately. Don't tell me how to run my ship, Mr. Barron. I'll tell you this, madam. Unless your first officer takes over immediately, I shall notify the British consul, and you'll not get clearance papers. You'll rot in Fu Chow till your command is confirmed by Dublin. And that will never happen. Good day, madam. <coughs> You were asking me about the King Henry, Captain West. Delay that, Mr. Hammond. We're sailing. Sailing? But you heard what he said. We're sailing immediately for Dublin. Let me tell you, it's a sorry thing laying your ship to harbor for the last time. Never again to go down to the sea in a British ship. But it's impossible, preposterous. James, it wasn't impossible. I brought the ship home. Without papers, without clearance? What I, a risk. I could get Master's papers with your consent. But perhaps. But there are other considerations. You risked your reputation and our good name to dally with some Yankee skipper. I did not. You were to meet him in Fuchau. So Hammond's been talking. And you risked the cargo with pirates by racing the Yank up the Ming. No, I'm afraid the Admiralty would consider you an unfit person to represent the Crown on a trade ship. And besides, you're a girl, James. I'm a woman. But a woman can't hold a position of authority over men. It, it's against nature. <laughs> went. Months of wrangling. Months of sitting by the window in silence, watching the gulls and the ships in from the Irish Sea. 
Plenty of time to remember the things that could never be forgotten. There was Jordan, the second mate. Mistress West is uncommon handy about ship. And Simpson, the cook. A giant of a man. A flying fish sailor, she is. I'm proud of that lump on my head. It's like a bloody decoration. And the bosun, the thought of stunfuls. She is Yar, that girl. <laughs> a daemon with a belaying pin. And the helmsman, who took the first orders I gave. I is just the Mistress West has. <laughs> and salt water in her veins. And Pantry McCoy, a wild and dissolute man. Ah, trim ship she is. She looks to be running free. Then, one day in September. Yes? My compliments, Captain West. Captain McCoy. I waited for you in Fu Chao. You never came. I know. And then I learned the reason, Captain Weston. So I came to you 5,000 miles by the log. Oh, isn't it wonderful? <clears throat> There's just one thing, Captain West. There's only one master of my ship. That's me. Yes, Captain McCoy. But I'd be proud to make you mistress of it. Oh, Captain McCoy. I could use a good first mate who's... Handy with a belaying pin. Oh. Uh, Captain West, will you marry me? I, I, oh, Kent. Jane, my darling. Let me tell you, the sound of the sea is a wonderful thing. And the wind in an arching sail is sweet. But not half so sweet as the soft words spoken by the man you love. This is what I've heard, and now I know it's sure. Sure as my name is Mrs. Chancy McCoy. <laughs> In a moment, our star, Miss Virginia Mayo, will return. The Navy Enlisted Men's Club in Tokyo is a pretty nice place where the men of the Navy can sit around and talk, read, or play cards on off-duty hours. It's a pretty nice place in another way, too. There's a box on the bar for the spare change of the sailors, and every penny that's dropped into it goes for the support of their private orphanage called the Home of Affection. Over 50 boys and girls of all ages are fed, clothed, and educated there. The orphanage has formed its own self-government, and the children are learning what it's like to live by democratic rules. With the help of the enlisted men of our Navy, they're meeting the world with a new hope, a new dignity, and pride. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. Now, here's Virginia Mayo. It's good to be back on land again. But I thoroughly enjoyed playing the part of Jane. And I'll be listening next week to your play, The Lady and the Tumbler. Yes, don't miss it, Virginia. It's a colorful and amusing romance with a dash of mystery. And it was chosen as a starring vehicle by one of our most popular stars, Fred McMurray. Ha, ah, sounds exciting, Ken. Good night. Good night. Theater is produced by Mr. Irving Cummings. Our orchestra is under the direction of Rudy Schrager. This is Ken Carpenter inviting you to join us next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. Hollywood Radio Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.